So thank you for being here today in the beautiful Mac Hall and in this uh, beautiful auditorium. We have a distinguished panel for you today, and so I'm going to be incredibly brief, but um, I have the privilege of uh, introducing our provost in just a moment. But this topic, I just want you to know from your president, environment, climate, and national security. I, I believe this is a sweet spot for us. Uh, since 1819, we've been in the business of preparing students uh, to defend this republic against whatever threats were facing the republic. In 1819, when we were located in, in Norwich, Vermont, you know what the threat was in 1819? It was the Brits coming over the green hills of Vermont again from Canada. That was the threat, and so we were training infantrymen, officers to lead infantrymen. That was the threat. I'm telling you today that climate and uh, the environment is a real national security threat, the changes in those issues. And so we need to be smart about this. And we have many programs that I think that support this critical work. And so as we've laid out our strategic plan of 2035 called Norwich After Next and have created centers like you're going to hear about here in just a minute from our provost, we are working on real world problems to allow you to work on real world problems as our faculty lead you in their research. So in your lifetime, not in mine probably, but it could happen, but in your lifetime, you're going to hear a lot more about climate. You're going to hear a lot more about water. There will be wars fought over water or lack of water. Mass migrations and all kinds of things. States toppling because they can't control their people. They can't feed them or they can't keep them in power. These will be your problems, real problems. And so what better place to start protecting the republic and also being good world citizens than right here when you're students? And so I want to thank our wonderful centers, both the Peace and War Center and our GRS Center, named for General Sullivan, but the Global Resiliency Center and Security Center, um, for bringing such a distinguished panel today to help us start to think about this, uh, because these are, these are real world problems that we've got. So it's very relevant and very timely. I'd like you to give a big round of applause to our wonderful provost and dean of the faculty, Sandra and Afnito, who's going to really kick this off. Well, good afternoon, everyone. What an honor and real pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, President Schneider, thank you again for your inspiring remarks and enduring support of all of our interdisciplinary scholarship and high impact practices that we engage in teaching and learning. These are the heart of what we do here at the institution. So on behalf of our centers and our faculty, we're grateful for your support of this creative work. General Sullivan, President Snyder, our panelists, invited guests, colleagues, and students here today, thank you for coming. Indeed, we're honored to kick off our panel presentation in a few minutes. But before I do so, I'd like to just provide a bit of background surrounding our centers for academic and research excellence. Remaining true to our guiding values of leadership, creativity, critical thinking, and engaged teaching and learning are three centers of research excellence, which include the Global Resilience and Security, or CGRS Center, the Center for Global Resilience and Security, the Peace and War Center, and the Norwich University Center for Advanced Computing and Digital Forensic, also called NUCAC DF, were all established with the overarching aim of providing opportunities for Norwich faculty and students to work side by side, tackling those very complex multidisciplinary world problems and exploring solutions through that same lens. Another major objective of our centers is to disseminate our research findings from this work through conferences, symposium, colloquium, and panel uh, conversations as we have here this afternoon. This past October of 2018, the three research centers that I just mentioned to you here on campus all aligned under our Office of Academic Research directed by our Associate Provost and Chief Research Officer, Dr. Karen 
Hinkle, who you'll meet a little later in our program this afternoon. Our discussion this evening on environmental security is indeed a great example of how each center brings its own individual distinctive strengths to the conversation, these critical conversations and mega topics while also bridging the gap to generate new knowledge. For example, C CGRS is providing its expertise relative to the areas of climate, water, energy, and infrastructure alongside the peace and war centers whose goals are to lead with peace, resolving conflict through dialogue, and being ready to engage when necessary in combat. Through this joint center panel initiative, we come together to ask very thought-provoking questions today, such as does environmental degradation impact national security? And how does this impact it? And what can we do to avoid or change the situation? These critical issues and conversations will be examined collectively by our panelists, our key distinguished and esteemed colleagues. And this collaboration demonstrates how we work together to answer those challenging questions and find solutions. Indeed, this is the pillars of what we do here at our institution, Norwich University. In our Norwich after, Norwich after Next University strategic plan, as President Snyder mentioned, we are forward thinking. We're involved with innovation in teaching and learning, interdisciplinary collaboration, inclusive leadership, and internationalization. The work of our centers, as you'll learn a little bit more about this evening, helps us to achieve these methods of innovative teaching and learning and experiential education which was envisioned by our find, founding father, Captain Alden Partridge. Our dedicated teachers and scholars here today and all throughout the university help us to advance these priorities in teaching and learning and values-based experiential pedagogy. The dialogue stimulated by our panel discussion this evening will not only contribute to advancing the conversation nationally about environmental security, but it will be one that will collectively speak to the needs nationally and how we will address them. This will be our voice or our national voice given our mission and vision of the centers um, for moving forward national agendas. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce two of our teacher scholars here this evening to my left who are moving this university mission forward through their vision, through their exemplary research and teaching. Certainly this models curiosity, collaboration, and leadership, which are at the core of what we do in the Centers of Research Excellence. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tara Kulkarni, our Associate Professor of Civil Engineering, who leads the Center for Global Resilience and Security, and Dr. Travis Morris, the Associate Professor of Criminal Justice who directs the Peace and War Center. Dr. Kulkarni will provide the context for the panel discussion. She'll partner with Dr. Morris as they serve as moderators for our lively discussion. Indeed, I'm looking forward tonight to being a student as we reflect upon these thoughtful conversations and learning exchanges relating to these major national concerns and issues which are of peak interest to all of us here this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Afanito and President Schneider. As Dr. Afanito mentioned, my name is Tara Kulkarni, and I direct our Center for Global Resilience and Security, and I am an associate professor in the David Crawford School of Engineering, teaching civil and environmental engineering. I will be your, one of your moderators for tonight. Again, I'd like to just welcome all of you here this afternoon. And uh, President Schneider, Dr. Afanito, thank you very much. My name is uh, Travis Morris, and I have the honor of being the director for the Peace and War Center. And uh, before we get started, I'd just like to cover some administrative details. So if you have a cell phone, please either turn it off or either turn it on vibrate. 
I'd also like to let each one of you know that this is being videotaped and live streamed. So for all of you that are joining us online, we'd like to uh, welcome you. Thanks for joining us as well. The, w the structure of the panel, uh, after we make our introduction remarks, we'll have a discussion followed up by a question and answer session that will start at 535. And then follow that, we'll have some concluding remarks. If you look at your program, you'll notice, if you've done the math, that, that there is one panelist that's not here, Sherry Goodman. She sends her regrets, but interestingly enough, she is in Washington, D.C. right now, speaking to the Senate Committee on Climate Change, as she's a member of that task force. And so um, I think that's a good reason not to make it here tonight here at uh, Norwich University. But uh, that's one of the reasons that you'll see that one of our panelists isn't uh, here. So we're going to go through and introduce the panelists, but we would like to ask each of you to hold your applause to the end until we introduce our esteemed panel. So Tara, I'll turn it over to you. All right. So last October, this was in 2018, the Peace and War Center and the Center for Global Resilience and Security were honored to partner with the Association for Environmental Health and Sciences Foundation, AEHS, and launch our environmental security initiative. This was in large part thanks to the efforts of Dr. Paul Kostecki, who is on our panel today, and he is also the executive director of the AEHS Foundation. He currently serves as the president. So it was also during that meeting in which we had the privilege of meeting Dr. Casey Bartram. And uh, she was part of a committee that was meeting together to discuss how do we bridge together the environmental concerns and security. And uh, both Dr. Kukarni and I were fortunate to meet her and it's our pleasure to see you here at Norwich University. She currently is executive director and environmental scientist at Terra Graphics International Foundation, which is a nonprofit international organization that assists communities in low-income countries to address environmental health concerns and crises associated with resource extraction. And to bridge these two areas of the environment and security, it's uh, our honor to have Colonel Bill Lyons on our panel this evening. I think he's a true exemplar of someone who straddles the intersections of both environment and security. Colonel Lyons is recognized as a thought leader and innovator in the delivery of architectural and engineering services. His areas of specialty include advanced mobility, military facilities, and international development. Colonel Lyons, we are very excited that you're here. Thank you. Thank you. And also, it's my distinct honor and privilege to introduce General Gordon R. Sullivan, class of Norwich University, 1959 who currently serves as the chairman of the board of the Army Historical Foundation in Arlington, Virginia. He also serves as the chairman of the board of the Marshall Legacy Institute and is a member of the MITRE Army Advisory Board, the MIT Lincoln Labs Advisory Board, and a life trustee of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. So from 1998 until this year, General Sullivan was the president and chief executive officer of the Association of the United States Army, which was also headquartered in Arlington. He retired from the Army in 1995 after 36 years as a soldier in active duty. He culminated his uniform service as the 32nd Chief of Staff of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He also recently completed an appointment as the Chairman of the Board of Trustees for Norwich University. Let's give our panelists a big round of applause. You will notice that a lot of the information on the bios of all of our panelists are also in the program. So I want to kind of revert back a few years to 2015. On February 5th, 2015, General Sullivan delivered a Todd lecture right here at Norwich University and the topic was National Security Implications of Climate Change. CGRS, the Center for Global Resilience and Security, is a direct result of that talk and General Sullivan's call to action. And we hope that by engaging in this discussion today, we can all be reminded of the role that we all need to play, whether we are seated here in this space or joining via live stream or watching this recording at a later time. 
This is the biggest challenge. A documentary, The Age of Consequences, made in 2016, presents many of the points General Sullivan made in his talk visually. So we have a trailer here for you to set the context for the rest of the conversation. We built society on this assumption of climate stability, and that stability is changing. All these things we take for granted, they're not just givens anymore. They just released report from the Pentagon climate change and the challenges it's creating for the military. The latest report says global warming is driving weather to new levels of extremes. 99% of my intelligence told me there's an ambush waiting for me. I don't get to say, yeah, but there's that 1% that says there's no ambush. So the hell with the other 99%. As a member of the United States military in 30 plus years of service in uniform, climate change is what we call an accelerant to instability. If you have an area that is already unstable and then has the additional challenge of water shortages or food shortages or a disaster that makes people move, then you can start seeing conflict situations. Serious, deadly conflict, a full-blown civil war. If we look around the world today, we can already see conflict and climate in play right under the headlines that we're reading. A new study finds climate change exacerbated the worst drought ever in modern Syria as a consequence of human interference. Fragile social systems just need one more shock to tip them over the edge into social breakdown, into war. Failure to think about how climate change might impact our globally interconnected system is a failure of imagination. The flip side of the climate threat is the energy and resilience opportunity. As a soldier, we're always looking to have an edge on the future. We can pay now, pay later. So with that, I'd like to turn over to our panelists. And I hope that each of you can give us a two-minute response to what you saw in the trailer. So Bill, could we start with you? Sure, thanks, Tara. And uh, just wanted to thank the university for giving me the opportunity to come back um, and to serve on this distinguished panel. Uh, in terms of the, the, the film, and I, I think the, the full film uh, really does justice to this issue, I think what it points out is the fact that climate change and the intersection of environmental sustainability and in, uh, international security is really a multidimensional complex problem. And the way we solve complex uh, multidimensional problems is with systems thinking, which is where most of my research has been focused in the past couple of years. I think when you think about the subject of environmental security, it's very easy to become overwhelmed by just how complex of a problem it is and how to solve it. But really, the true way to approach that problem set is to pick it apart, identify its pieces, and then put it all back together again with a multidisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary approach, which is totally appropriate to this forum with the two centers. Uh, and I think that's exactly why we're all here, is to look at this from a multidisciplinary approach, from an economic approach, from an engineering approach, from a political science approach. All of these disciplines need to be brought to bear. I think this film really does a good job highlighting that. The other point that I'd like to make is we treat all of our uh, asymmetric threats to our national security uh, from a multidisciplinary and uh, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, we look at counterterrorism from that perspective. We look at weapons of mass destruction from that perspective. We look at um, various other uh, threats. What we really need to do is think about climate change as one of these asymmetric threats that's a threat to our national security and stability and apply our academic, industrial, and societal resources to solve it no less than we've tried to solve our, our counterterrorism problem from a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach. Thank you, Colonel Lyons. General Sullivan? Yeah. Um, pay now, pay later. I was on a study put together by Ms. Sherry uh, 
that. Um, uh, let me tell you about this study. This study had 11 four-star and three-star generals and admirals. It was in. Um, it was organized in um, 1996, and um, I had known uh, Sherry Goodman when she was the uh, one of the assistant secretaries of defense for the environment. Um, anyway, so she called me up one day and said, "I'd like you to be on this board." I said, Sherry, I don't know anything about uh, climate change or anything. She said, yeah, that's the point. Um, but you solved the problem with the woodpecker. We had a woodpecker down in the southeast who lived in the heart of a 50-year-old pine tree and raised its uh, uh, chicks or whatever you call them um, in that little nest. And it ate, it had, the pine tree had to be 50 years old to have housed all these bugs. So anyway, uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> the impact area at Fort Bragg, North Carolina was the only place, and Camp Lejeune were the only places that you could find 50-year-old white pines in the southeast because guess what the farmers were doing? They were cutting them down and selling them for chim timber. So anyway, we had to come up with some solutions and we did and we, we at least saved some of them. All right, so anyway, she said, come on and let's, don't tell me you can't do it, just come with me on this journey. And then I became the, uh, the chairman of this board uh, let me just tell you, we had uh, 11 of us. Uh, the director of the Na former director of the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, um, a former Air Force officer who was the operations officer of the uh, Air Force, um, a former uh, Commander-in-Chief, uh, Naval Forces Europe and Allied Forces Southern Europe, uh, former Chief, uh, Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Commander of the Pacific Fleet and uh, U.S. Ambassador to China, former NASA Administrator, Shuttle Astronaut, astronaut and the first Commander of the Naval Space Command, um, former Deputy Commander Headquarters, U U.S. Uh, European Command, and former Commander-in-Chief, um, Central Command, and myself, uh, former Chief of Staff of the Army. Okay, so we, we had this study, and we came up with some findings, which I will talk about, but not in great, great depth. I want to... Um, <clears throat> Before we get into that, I want to read you something. And the person who uh, can tell me, other than my colleague to my right, um, where this came from uh, will win some kind of a prize. I'm going to read this. I wish I could stand before you and say that my own generation had brought strength and meaning to man's relation to nature, that we had looked upon the majesty and beauty and terror of the earth we inhabit and learned wisdom and humility. Alas, this cannot be said, for it is we who have brought into being a fateful and destructive power. But the stream of time moves forward and mankind moves with it. Your generation must come to terms with the environment. Your generation must face realities instead of taking refuge in ignorance and evasion of truth. Yours is a grave and sobering responsibility, but it is also a shining opportunity. You go out into a world where mankind is challenged as it has never been challenged before to prove its mat maturity and its mastery not only of nature but of itself. Therein lies our hope and our destiny. 
in today already walks tomorrow. Who said that and when? Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson said that in 1962 of man and the stream of time. Ladies and gentlemen, we have stood by and other than things like DDT and maybe Agent Orange finally, we have recognized that we have to do something to continue life on this planet as it is now. Thank you, sir. I think that, that just brings up this really excellent point. And I want to follow up on the report that General Sullivan was talking about. And if any of you need copies, um, I can make those available to you. The CNA Military Board also recently came up with similar recommendations for energy security. And once again, the board was made up of 18 senior military leaders, generals, colonels, and admirals. So I really appreciate you bringing that up, sir. Paul? your uh, response to the trailer? <clears throat> Let me uh, stop by putting my career in context is I look at the environment maybe in three buckets. One is environmental protection, one is environmental restoration, and then the last one is environmental security. I've spent some, most of my life in the environmental restoration part. That's the cleanups, uh, uh, assessing risk to communities, to individuals, to the um, uh, poor communities and, and so forth, and um, uh, solving those problems seemed uh, uh, very significant. And uh, and everyone I know that worked on those are dedicated to that. Um, and so I'm new to the environmental security areas, even to start to think about that. But what I took away from that trailer is um, it's that component, environmental security. I mean, we shouldn't stop restoring the environment and dealing with the Agent Oranges of the world and PCBs and PFOS. Um, but ultimately, it's the climate change factor that supersedes everything else. Um, that doesn't mean we turn our back on the others and focus in on that. I think they're um, entwined together and are certainly the quality of life as we go forward. Um, the restoration will make life better but ultimately, the climate change solution will make life possible uh, in the long term. One of the things that struck me with what General Sullivan uh, just said in, in, in uh, introducing himself and how he got involved in the environment, and I look out here as one of the points that, um, that I come away with is the solution to environmental problems are not just going to be in the environmental engineers. Um, it's going to be not just the chemists, it's not just the biologists, and so I want you to think of that. I know it's an engineering school, and just because you're an electrical engineer, you know, what do I know? What do I care? Well, you'll have a, you'll have a, a significant component to that solution as well. I guess the point taken is you don't have to be you know, brought up in the environment, thinking about the environment every day to be the person doing it. We all need different perspectives, and we need everybody working on the solution. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. And Casey, we know you bring a completely different perspective, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on the trailer. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you to the president and provost for the great introduction and to you both for organizing such a great event. Um, so I, I work in the environmental health field as well, but my, com my organization works on addressing uh, health issues that are related to mining and um, recycling. And for the past nine years, we've been working in northern Nigeria, which is right on the edge of the Sahel. And the film, the full documentary, which if you haven't seen, it's really worth watching. They highlight the Sahel for a very good reason. And it's because it's considered the front line of the interaction between climate and conflict. So this is the region just below the Sahara Desert in Africa. Um, in Nigeria specifically, we're doing a cleanup related to artisanal gold mining. So this has resulted in widespread contamination in several villages. Um, it ended up poisoning and killing 400 children, poisoned thousands more. Um, and the project, the reason I bring it up is because it highlights this um, 
topic in, in many ways. There's so many interactions between all of the different disciplines, as, as the other panelists have pointed out. Um, in Nigeria specifically, I think it's important to highlight two things from that project that are brought up in the movie as well, that first, climate change impacts health and livelihoods, and the second is that it can destabilize. And so on that first point with livelihoods and health, we're actually seeing evidence in Nigeria that the combination of high gold prices in the world and the impacts of climate change are driving people to move towards artisanal gold mining and away from agriculture and herding. And it's really become subsistence mining. So people are moving away from subsistence agriculture and those types of Easy. livelihoods and moving towards mining. And in this case, it has really uh, strong health impacts. So we have people who have severe lead poisoning with mercury exposures, a lot of important contaminants that are released as a result. And this is just artisanal gold mining. There's like electronic waste recycling, uh, other forms of informal mining, uh, battery recycling. Those are all informal industries that people are tending to move towards because they're having, a, they're having difficulty meeting their livelihoods in traditional ways. The second point on destabilization is that people who live hand to mouth pastoralist or agrarian lifestyles are finding it increasingly difficult to survive, and this is resulting in conflict over natural resources, such as water and arable land, which is really brought out well in this film. There's two major tribes in the region in Nigeria that we work in. One is a nomadic herding tribe, and one is a farming tribe. Nine years ago, working in this part of Nigeria, the greatest threat to us in the region we worked in was Boko Haram, but they operated 300 miles away. So that meant for us that we could walk between villages, that the security context was very stable, and it was the same for locals living there. They, they didn't have to worry so much about that happening so far away. Today, a combination of drought-induced crop shortages, water shortages for the herders, has increased those tensions between those two tribes to the point that there's a lot more conflict. This is in addition to climate refugees who have come down from the Niger, the Niger, or the Lake Chad region and are flooding into parts of Nigeria looking for water and land. And so what we see now is criminal activity is so rampant that we can't access most of the villages that we worked in nine years ago. The security context has totally changed in that part of the world. And so I think I really appreciate the comments from the other panelists on looking at this as an integrated issue and thinking about how we approach this looking at resource extraction, health, jobs, climate change, and conflict, because they're all really inextricably related to each other. Thank you. So as all of you have read our panelists' bio and heard a little bit about their background, um, you can deduct that some started their career in environmental studies or potentially environmental security, and others migrated there. So we'd just like to ask each one of the panelists in about a two minute or so response, um, how did you personally get involved in this subject? So in other words, was it an epiphany? Was it a gradual process or a watershed moment? If, if each of you could just uh, share with the audience how the subject uh, became relevant to you in any order, whoever would like to go first. <clears throat> well, I think, uh, my eyes were gradually opening to the issues associated with uh, climate change and environmental security on two fronts. One is a military officer uh, deployed to Iraq and Bosnia and to the Gulf a few times and saw the effects that uh, the uh, air pollution and, um, and solid waste pollution were having in the Middle East and in, in, uh, in um, Southern Europe. Um, and on the, with my military hat on, with my civilian hat on, hat on as a civil engineer, my firm was very involved in lead projects, uh, other sustainability types of projects. So my my awareness had been heightened uh, primarily as a business opportunity in that context. But my eyes really were opened when I started doing work for the Department of Defense and U.S. Agency for International Development overseas, and I watched some of the second and third order effects of climate change manifest themselves in these small rural villages all over Latin America and in, uh, in, uh, the cent uh, in Central, uh, Central Command area of responsibility of the Middle East. So I watched kind of the convergence of this environmental security issue, both from an environmental sustainability context 
and from a national security perspective. I learned a lot about it at the War College, and, and that actually inspired me to uh, write uh, my thesis at the War College on this very soft subject of how can we use our national resources to prevent conflict through investing in environmental security and international development rather than invest our natural resources in conflict resolution or war and the recovery process, which is five times more expensive. Uh, having survived the, the Iraq war and seen the outcome of how much of our national treasure was invested in rebuilding that country, it really became an, a, a personal imperative to be involved in preventing that kind of conflict again through environmental security initiatives. Thank you, Colonel Lyons. Others? Okay, so, so Sherry says, come on, so I go. And uh, somehow, as I said, I became the chairman of this thing. And uh, anyway, uh, so we had some meetings and we had some experts come in. And um, so we'd have one expert on, on a climate-related subject, and um, he or she would be bumped up against someone else who had another set of figures. And after a while, it became apparent that um, it became apparent when I listened to some uh, some of those arguments at both ends of the table up on Capitol Hill that um, people were looking for 100% perfect knowledge. I got news for you, gang. If you wait for 100% perfect knowledge, you're not going to get it because people have their own set of figures and their own way of reaching nirvana. And it became apparent to me that we had to stop, we being the panel, had to stop seeking perfectness. Perfectness is enemy of good enough. Mm -hmm. What are the trend lines? Frankly, all of the trend lines we looked at we're going in the wrong direction. You can take a sailboat, a wooden sailboat of some size now, and go from Maine to Alaska today. Today. Now, not in the winter, but in the summer. You can do it. And do you know how many icebreakers Russia has and China? how many they're building. Let me tell you, gang, we got a problem. The United States has one, one, and the other one is not operational right now. The Coast Guard has them, not the Navy. I'm not making, that's not a criticism of the Coast Guard, that's just where they are. Look, what are we going to do about the trend lines? We were at, people asked me, I, I actually had somebody interview me, and they asked me, how did we handle the Cold War and nuclear weapons and the Russians and so forth and so on? Um, well, it was a known problem, and we had treaties and so forth and so on, which, by the way, we don't now. Um, we knew that we had to come up with solutions or the National Command Authority, the President, and so forth, would be forced to make a decision on the use of nuclear weapons, and none of us in the military wanted that to happen. Um, so in, in this business of climate change, it seems to be moving in a direction which is quite serious. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? I think there must be a concerted effort, 
then Norwich might as well be the place to start it. To educate people on what these trend lines mean and how can we address this problem. I mean, there's some things you can do. You can lift the piers down at uh, the Navy Yard or the Navy base down at Norfolk. I don't, I don't want to go into the details of that. Just say the, the ocean is rising and we have to raise the piers because the electricity that runs those ships, submarines, and aircraft carriers when they're up at berth um, is under the pier. And it's soon, all the electrical engineers of the world know you probably shouldn't put a, a cable like that in salt water. Um, anyway, that's, that's very expensive. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kostecki. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting question. No, no one's ever asked me that, and I've never thought about it before. Welcome um, to Norwich, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think it's a twofold, and I'm going to answer it. How did I get um, concerned with environmental security, not just climate, but environmental security? I think it was a gradual maturity on my part over my career. I started out um, with dealing with underground storage tanks. I don't know if you remember that. That was back in the 70s, and it was it had to do with the petroleum embargo, and it was the price of gasoline went up, and it were $1.2 million, uh, $1 million underground storage tanks in this country that were uh, left vacant. And they had anywhere from a few gallons to thousands of gallons. And people just walked away from them back then. So it was pretty significant, and we walked, worked on that. And um, uh, as I said, it, I was more into the restoration part of it. Uh, and then in the uh, 90s, I was contacted uh, um, by the Kuwait government. And I got involved with the what they called the oil lakes of Kuwait. Um, and I saw firsthand what devastation, environmental devastation can do. This is where the Iraqis, as they left Kuwait, um, damaged and blew up um, all of the 756 oil wells in Kuwait. Just, and it, unfortunately for Kuwait, their oil is under artesian pressure. And once you just break the seal, it just spills out over the, the lands. So I, and it was oil lakes. That's how I never thought they should have characterized it as oil lakes. I mean, lakes have a nice kind of connotation. These were oil lakes from the sky, it looked like northern Minnesota. And that led to uh, tens of thousands of migratory birds dying, uh, wildlife dying. Uh, the pictures that I saw were just devastating. And it was probably then that I started thinking about security um, and international and how countries can just devastate another country environmentally. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's, I, it wasn't an epiphany at the time, but it just kind of sunk in there and stayed in my mind. And as I moved forward, it, it just kind of built and built to the point of about a year and a half ago, I started thinking this way. And one of the things that I do is kind of uh, what General Sullivan was talking about when he was on a committee, had all these people coming and telling you, is uh, we've been very involved in putting on uh, conferences and bringing experts together. 35 years in Amherst, Massachusetts, 25 years on the West Coast. And uh, we've probably had over 25,000 people uh, over those years come and talk about the solutions and the problems. And um, I started thinking, well, I'm just starting to think about security. I'm not a security person. I need to, I had, I need to seek out people who think that way and by very fortunate that uh, I was led uh, to Norwich. And the more I talked to uh, Travis and, um, and Tara, it was obvious that my background in environmental and, and, and the approaches of how we solve things and what Norwich and what they represented was a marriage made in heaven, a perfect match. And so um, that's how I got into where I am today, slowly but surely. Thank you. So for me, I went into environmental science not because I was interested at all in climate change. Um, but I think anybody who works in a field even remotely related to the environment and many people who work in fields not remotely related to the environment are dealing with climate change. 
you look at mining companies and most of them on their websites have a climate change adaptation strategy. And that, that's from a for-profit mining company. And so really I think you, know, you get into the climate change work because you, you have to. It's something that we're all facing in our everyday lives and, and in our jobs. In terms of environmental security, um, I think my first exposure to that was more along the lines of environmental justice. Um, there's this well-established um, concept called a resource curse, where countries that, ha that are blessed with resources such as oil or precious minerals or diamonds, that kind of thing, many, not all, but many, are also entracted in a lot of violence. They have low development indexes. Uh, there's a whole bunch of research in this, and it, it's quite a paradox. And so that's what I think of initially when I think of environmental security, is that resource curse and the fact that when we look at these countries, the environmental degradation goes hand in hand with conflict and security issues. Um, and so it's, it's become, again, a much broader interdisciplinary idea. Really, when you look at the word security, we often think as Americans of domestic security, of defense, but security in other contexts is applied to food security or economic security. And so if you think about it in a broader sense, it's something that we're all working in in one way or another. Thank you. And actually, that's a really nice segue into my next question, which, Bill, I was hoping to ask you. So Colonel Lyons sent me this really incredible schematic um, of all the possible interconnections. I'm going to display it here. It comes up. And I want you to talk us through this a little bit. And, and really what I'm getting at is when we talk about environmental security, it often means different things to different people. And I hope through our conversation so far, we've been trying to unentangle the bits and pieces just a little bit. But then you see something like this. So I want to yield the floor to you and hope you can walk us through a little bit of this. Sure. Thanks, Tara. I'm going to just spin around a little bit. Sorry about that. So th this is a product of my, uh, my recent research at the University of Cambridge. And um, one of the things that Cambridge teaches is an interdisciplinary, it's a center uh, like the centers here. And it teaches an interdisciplinary approach to problem solving. And this was my feeble attempt to try and explain the intersection of uh, sustainability and national security. Uh, the, the point of all this, uh, this little diagram of entangled uh, blobs is really to show just how complex this issue is, uh, despite what Tara said of, the, of having all of the different components. I mean, this is just really a fraction of the different factors that go into this intersection between uh, environmental sustainability, um, social sustainability, economic sustainability, and national security. My research is focused on a one link uh, here, which is uh, really the notion between international development aid and infrastructure development. So the, that color, I'm colorblind, I apologize, but that color signifies a counterbalancing uh, factor in a causal loop, whereas everything else is contributing to the problem. So as an example, urbanization is contributing to climate change, which is complete, contributing to resource competition. And if you follow the whole thing back around, it's contributing to loss of agriculture, food insecurity, concentrated poverty, pollution, and we could go on. Mm -hmm. uh, to Casey's point, all of these things contribute to one another. And as a, as a community of professionals and academics and, and people who are really care about the future of our planet, what we really need to think about is how can we all find one of those little links, study it, work on it, get together with other people from other disciplines, and develop countermeasures to prevent those things from from accelerating. That's really what this causal loop diagramming is, is showing, acceleration without a break. And, uh, and my research has been dedicated to trying to figure out what the breaks are. So in this particular diagram, I'm talking about infrastructure development and international aid as one, one single measure of ways to address uh, this accelerating causal loop. But I think it's up to each of us in this room and each of us uh, as Americans, as patriots, to figure out what's our little link and how can we take a deep dive, maybe in one link, and then get together with somebody else that's working another link, and somebody else that's working another link, and try to find countermeasures to prevent this from spiraling out of control. I think that's really the existential threat that uh, not just our nation, but our planet faces. And as, as leaders of the free world, I think we have an obligation to be the break and to help figure this thing out 
Um, it's complex, it's hairy, it's, it's an ugly problem set. And it's, that's just a fraction, a fraction of the problem set. But you can see, um, based on my research, you know, you, you get resource competition, it turns into corruption, crime, disorder, that turns into in, income inequality, civil war, regional conflict, and at the top up there you have international military intervention. And if you need to see an example of this, go watch Black Hawk Down, and that'll give you a, a very good example of how this causal loop actually played out in the real world. And uh, you know, one of Norwich's uh, probably, in my opinion, one of Norwich's most uh, impressive young graduates of my generation is Tom DiTomaso, who uh, was in that uh, in that conflict um, and. You know, he, he, he's a Norwich guy that lived this in real time. That, that caused a loop. He was smack dab in the middle of it in real time. So if you think it's not going to be something in your lifetime, I have news for you. And Tom is not an environmentalist. He's certainly not a, uh, an engineer or, or anything like that. He was an infantryman and a damn good infantryman. And he found himself right in the middle of this, call, this uh, causal loop. So I think it's important for all of us to see ourselves in this loop and figure out how we can contribute to solving the problem. Hope that wasn't too long. Thank, Thank you. you. That was excellent. So one of the phrases or terms you used uh, several times was complex. And anyone just has to look at this diagram and understand the complexity associated with environmental security. And one of the things that populations tend to do is to simplify in a complex problem in order to make it understandable. So the diagram that was just on the screen, someone may focus on just one hub and talk about it. And as General Sullivan said, use evidence to either support, confirm, or deny dimensions of that particular hub. But if we want to address an issue that's multifaceted or multidimensional, I want to step back and just look at two sides. One area in which we've made some progress over the past 20 years or so, and another area which is the greatest challenge. So Casey, I'd like to ask you the following question. From your line of work, your research, your travels abroad, what's an area of progress or success? And this can either be from the US or another nation. And the second part of that is what you identify from your perspective is a, one of the greatest challenges. Again, that can be from a US perspective or a global perspective. So in other words, just to reiterate, it's looking at two dimensions of this issue. Casey, please. Thank you. Um, I think one of the, I'm going to start with the challenge first. I think one of the great challenges is that uh, the people who are most impacted by climate change are often the ones with the least voice. Um, and so when we look at climate change adaptation strategies or um, look at ways to move beyond uh, the problems and, and suggesting solutions, those people often don't have a voice at that table. Um, it's, it's even more uh, unjust because those, the people who are most impacted are moving towards jobs that are more risky to themselves and to their families, producing products that are cheap for people like us, for our cell phones and our cars. And they're in, we're the ones producing most of the carbon emissions. And um, so there's a lot of environmental justice issues that I think are some of the bigger challenges there. In terms of successes, I think there have been some great regional efforts. I know that the UN has a program uh, in Africa looking at suggesting and promoting our alternative livelihoods. One of them is artisanal gold mining. And they're looking at that and trying to, I, I think and I hope, looking at ways to make it safer for folks and get it legalized and uh, developing frameworks for bringing that into um, a form of subsistence mining, which is really interesting. And I think there's a lot of hope for ideas like that as long as they're developed at the local level and in conjunction with local folks who are the ones who are really feeling the effects of, of climate change and security issues. Excellent. Thank you. Others? Same question. From your perspective, the people you've interacted with, the literature you've read, things you've seen domestically and abroad, greatest challenge, greatest success. What it you're probably the best guy to answer this question. <laughs> um, so we know that Poland, Hungary, even Germany is drifting back 
into the 30s with nationalism and very nationalistic groups. I'm not going to go any further than that. I'll let people's imagination fill in the blanks. But what we have is NATO sort of is there. Uh, Travis, we, are we in or out? That's a good question, sir. No, no. I, so I don't so want to put you. On the I, I'll, spot. I'll just respond to a success, which I, I would argue probably the majority of people in the audience don't know. NATO has been in front of the environmental issue for a, a while in terms of policy. So you can just go to their website and you can see they've published several manuals on this, and they've identified environmental security and also protection. But NATO is a host of countries, and where we fit into that's the other question, meaning the United States, sir. So as far as the ideology, the ideology associated with some of the European countries is negating that environmental issue. You got That'd it. That'd be my take. I'll, I'll offer a, a success and a challenge. I think the success is that in the past 10 years or so, uh, to, to great credit to industry, industry has become a leader in many ways of the sustainability challenges. Companies like PepsiCo, Unilever, uh, and many others, I don't want to unduly point out any companies that might not be on the list or uh, go too far on the list of, of, of good guys, but corporate social responsibility policies, investment in sustainable um, supply chains on behalf of companies like that have really changed not just the reality on the ground in emerging and developing countries and economies and making a difference in sustainability and environmental security, reducing the likelihood of um, of deforestation and resource depletion, um, I think that's a good news story, that industry, rather than government at this point, especially in the United States, is leading the charge on a more sustainable and environmentally uh, sus uh, uh, resilient future. I think one of the greatest challenges that I see doing a lot of international development work is creating an environment of, of dependence. So, you know, we, as the United States, many people in this room might not even be aware that we literally invest billions of dollars annually in the developing world to, to move the needle on some of these issues. And, and one of the risks, one of the challenges <clears throat> is not creating a, a culture of dependence where these countries are totally uh, dependent on us to uh, make those investments that they, should, they themselves should be making. By way of example, <clears throat> I mentioned today that I'm, I'm working on a a hospital wing in Lusaka, Zambia, that was a brand new hospital in 1982 built by the Japanese. Uh, we are going to completely replace it in 2018 with a, another brand new hospital built by the United States. That's not sustainable. I mean, we can't wait another 40 years for some other government to come along and build them a brand new hospital. So we need to we need to be conscious of the cycle of dependency, and <clears throat> and create investments that result in, in a more sustainable future. And, and I think that's a, a tremendous challenge that many of us don't think about. Thank you. Paul? Well, again, I've just started thinking about environmental security at that level. So I'll just, um, more from someone who you know, uh, has, has just watched things, I would say, um, touching upon what just Bill just said, that I've, a lot more um, a private sector, not just the companies, but the insurance companies have uh, taken that up as well. I know some in uh, England, Lloyds of London, there's an environmental security component to the loans, to the support, you know, the uh, funding that they put out there. So I think that's good when you, not that I like insurance companies, but um, they tend to, I think, be able to drive things. Um, I just read in the Globe recently that the uh, city of Boston has substantial amount of money and effort going into climate change effects on the city. So I think you're seeing that more and more, certainly over the last 10 years, if not just the last five years. So I'd point those to successes. The failure, um, I think, is, uh, I'm sure you've seen this, and we all know the reasons, but you know, migration uh, of people from one land to another to countries, I mean, we're seeing that. It's part of the na problem with nationalism that's happening in Europe. And some people would argue here as well. I just, I just look at uh, North Amer South America. I mean, you look at Mexico, and the flow is 
towards Mexico, and one of the reasons is the economy is so good in Mexico. You look at Honduras or you know, Colombia and now Venezuela, so I think we've failed uh, in we being the U.S. and, and addressing the, the issues, the poverty issues, and obviously the food, and I know it's all ge it's political, and it's not just a simple enough water, um, but uh, someone I was talking to uh, thought something like a Marshall Plan for South America that we would head up might be a good thing. Yeah, we're, we're putting out a lot of funding for that, but the payback for, for us, the U.S., would be great. It might not be overnight, but it would certainly be something that would, um, I think, address the issue of having uh, migration up from, from South America. Um, we also have to take better care of the people that do come up here, but that's a uh, talk for another time. But. Well, that brings to mind this concept that we're in this institution that's produced leaders in all of these fields that you've talked about, whether it's uniform or leading industrial uh, companies and, and students who've gone all over the world and um, raised the Norwich flag. So my question really is about leadership and what it takes to be a leader in a field that's as complex as this one that we are talking about, environmental security. So if I could have a response from each of you and just maybe the, just the key things of what you think a leader uh, needs to have or how do you become a leader in this field of environmental security? Well, I, I'd like to key in on something that General Sullivan said and was also referenced in the, in the movie. Uh, leadership is getting out in front of something and not necessarily having all the facts. Um, you know, leading a, a brigade or a battalion in the military or a corporation or for that matter a not-for-profit requires you to have foresight to identify trends, to get out in front of those trends and create opportunity, whether that opportunity is to defeat the enemy or to create a new product or to innovate in the non-governmental sphere. So one of the problems that we have is this problem that General Sullivan pointed out, which is uh, I want 100% certainty uh, about what's going to happen with climate. And I want to be absolutely persuaded that man is, uh, mankind is creating climate change and climate change actually happening. Uh, the fact that we doubt scientists uh, that have, with a very high degree of certainty, projected the likeliness of this uh, is, is a little mind-boggling to me. But true leadership, true leadership is stepping out in front of these trends and being an advocate and being persuasive and understanding the facts and creating the space for intelligent, thoughtful, critical analysis of a set of facts and circumstances that allows us to envision different outcomes. So if we want to, rate, we want to lower global temperatures by two degrees over the next 20 years, how do we get there? Somebody's going to lead that effort. Hopefully, people in this room will step forward after they've graduated and lead this effort. It's a lot about persuasion. It's a lot about uh, intuition. It's a lot about conceiving outcomes other than predetermined outcomes. And uh, to me, uh, the fact that uh, some people can get out in front of this with confidence and project uh, those futures and allow the, for the space to think critically, is, is that's true leadership in my mind. Others? I think I would just add on to that because it leads in really well to what I was thinking about. Um, leadership to me is, is at least in part knowing when it's time to ask questions, when it's time to say I don't, I don't have all the information, I need to talk to people who know what they're talking about, to talk to the scientists or to talk to experts in that field. And then there's also a time when it's, it's appropriate to stop getting more information and to act. And I think often we're we're afraid to make mistakes, especially as young leaders. That's something that's really intimidating. Um, and so that's maybe a hard decision to make in terms of when you stop asking questions and start taking action. The beauty, for lack of a better word, of this topic is that if we act on climate change, it's, it's in reducing environmental pollution and reducing carbon emissions. And if that ends up being a mistake, it's really not a terrible one to have made because there's great there's great benefits for that otherwise. So, um, I think I think that that issue with leadership and knowing when it's time to act is is a crucial thing. Yeah, I want to uh, follow up on that. It's what you were saying. It's doing. A leader does. A leader doesn't talk. A leader does things and it's action. 
Yeah. Um, they also, I think leaders have a certain set of guiding principles that other people look at and, um, and, and admire and want to be like them. It's honesty, a hard work, doing what you say you'll do. Somebody said showing up is 80% of the job. Um, and I think that's what um, a, a good leader is. Um, it's somebody who, it's, it's like on a basketball team and all these superstars, and one of the things that they'll say is, why is he so good? He's great because he makes everybody around him better. That's a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, leadership's a verb. Hmm. It's not a noun. It's a verb. You got to do something. And this subject right here, the way this has evolved, is hugely complicated. It's made up of scientists, technologists, people, the team. Who's on the team? You, that little Venn, well, it's not a Venn diagram, whatever it is. It's a, I don't know what the hell to call it, but it's little balls coming together. And if you can understand that and draw something that people can understand and execute, I mean, look, we, in the last Munich <coughs> session with the uh, United States sent somebody, I don't know who they sent, but, uh, or we sent, um, the United States did not mention democracy, did not mention liberty. It was, it was like, that didn't, you know, NATO stands for all of that stuff. And all of a sudden, how do we transcend that? Are we in or out? Challenge of our time, sir. Yeah, right. So that's actually a, a good segue into opening up the floor for questions from the audience. You'll notice there's two mics set off um, at either end here. So if you have a question, please walk up to the mic. I think it's quiet enough in here that if you just wanted to shout it out, that would be okay too if you're feeling shy and don't want to walk through the rows of people that are sitting next to you. But we'd love some questions. We've had so many interesting thoughts come up. I have plenty of questions of my own, but I want to turn over to the audience now. Any questions from the audience? Here's a leader. First man up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was running away. I was counting on you to answer to ask the first question. All right, I'll bite. I'll bite. And it's a Marine. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or evening. Uh, since you called me out, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, if you had to summarize this entire uh, panel, this meeting that we've had, um, in order to, I guess, kind of put it in terms, maybe for the students, I'm a business major, uh, so I'm not super into the, uh, the, maybe some of the lingo of uh, climate change and whatnot. Um, if you had to summarize kind of what this whole thing is about and what my generation can do about it, um, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thank you. What are you going to do to save the world? <laughs> Pick one of those bubbles. It doesn't matter what one. Find a business that solves one of those problems and get at it. Because if everybody in this room does their part, my children will have some place to live that's not a burning hot ball of fire. Thank you. I would say that what this panel is is one of hopefully many, many uh, activities uh, that tries to bring to the forefront the problems we have and, potential, and get people thinking. We were talking before we were up here. It's like, you're a business major. You're going to get something in front of somebody seven times before they actually will go, if it's buying a book or, or whatever. So this is one of the seven times that you'll be um, uh, in front of a panel of people talking about how severe climate change is and what we need to do um, to go forward and start finding solutions. Thank you. I think um, as a business major, you've probably noticed that every, every job and every endeavor has a bottom line, and there's always an economic <coughs> context to think about. Uh, I don't think it's any different with climate change. 
I think that you're always going to be able to incorporate that into your careers or into your lives or both. And often it will be in a way that is beneficial not only to you, but to other, to the next generation. And if you do so the bottom line with climate change is life and survival. It's not the dollars. I was going to add that if you do want a full summary of the panel, stay tuned till the end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to Professor Lassar, who I believe has another question for the panel. Thank you. Uh, I um, teach a course uh, in, at Norwich University called Infrastructure Control. <clears throat> but uh, and we start off by talking about uh, what that meant in the beginning 20 years ago when uh, infrastructure meant protecting a, the country against cyber attack. <clears throat> and then we talked about uh, what was done at that time uh, to protect, to allocate the resources that the country had optimally so that to uh, optimize our chances of surviving or especially resilience, okay? The, <clears throat> the cybersecurity people here are very good at putting up the security, but the engineers are working on what happens when security fails and uh, the uh, enemy breaks through. Now, okay, 20 years later, um, <clears throat> as working with the uh, graduate school here, uh, the CGCS, uh, the, um, I, we, we came across an update on that with regard to uh, uh, <clears throat> a book about uh, which takes into account some of the things that Bill was getting in with the cycle of dependency and trying to model those things mathematically for infrastructure, uh, but protecting infrastructure in general. Now, the uh, models depend on putting, trying to put money, uh, excuse me, not money, but uh, numbers on the sensitivity of the different parameters in the, uh, for better or lack of a better thing, cycle of dependency here trying to quantify that to say how much would the resources make a difference on those different bubbles in Bill's cycle of dependency. What that did was uh, Casey referred to a, a point early on <clears throat> about an industrial example, and then she just gave the example, but just mentioned it, then went on. And I was wondering if she would expand on that and talk about why that industrial example um, was uh, a forward thinking or a good thing, because we're looking to model, quantify some of the things that Bill's talking about, and we need examples like that. Excellent, thank you for the question. Um, I think it's, a, it's also about how you frame what, what you've referred to as the cycle of dependency, because part of it is how we, we go in and design or, or conceptualize aid to begin with. The project I spoke of in Nigeria, um, it was an environmental cleanup project where we partnered with both Doctors Without Borders as well as other NGOs and international agencies, but most importantly, we partnered with the Nigerian governments. We did not do an environmental cleanup. We advised and built capacity within local, state, and federal government to do that project. So when we started there in 2010, we had 20 international volunteers coming over to do environmental sampling and risk assessment. By 2013, there were two of us working in Nigeria on a project just as large, but with a much different approach where the Nigerian actors had really taken over most of the project in just those few years. And so I think part of it is how we set up our aid and our interventions to try and build that capacity and really work with local people on the ground in order to do that. Does that answer your question a little bit? In a way, and it helps to explain why <clears throat> in the last two or three years, <clears throat> the engineering students that we get from Africa are, are, are most concerned about these problems and that, that they, when we talk about principles and they ask them to suggest a problem that they're interested in, they refer to the types of things you're talking about. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much for the question. A couple questions over here. Good evening. Uh, you had mentioned about the bottom dollar in business and the bottom dollar in the environment. Uh, I think it applies to the problem with the gold mines in Nigeria, but also the reluctance of U.S. businesses to adopt um, renewable forms of energy uh, in preference of cheaper, more uh, efficient, cost-wise uh, forms of energy. How can we sort of incentivize or shift 
um, that nature in business, um, not necessarily the nature of business to pursue profit, but how can we make these things less costly, less uh, of an issue for profit without things like subsidization or government regulation that are going to create shortages or uh, pass that problem on to the consumer? Um, I, think, I think General Sullivan might have answered that question earlier when he said you pay now or you pay later. So I think that that would be the most simple and direct answer to your question. I do think that there is a lot more research and um, business going on around renewable energy. When you're out, I, I live in Idaho, um, there's an incredible amount of development of wind power. It's really become um, the leading source, the, the most, uh, the fastest growing renewable energy source that we're seeing out there. And so I think that we're on the right track. I think there's a lot of ideas that haven't that haven't been put on the table yet. And I think that there's probably um, people at this at this table and people in the audience who who could lead the charge in that. And it, um, in Massachusetts, the fastest growing area for employment is clean energy, the clean energy sector. So it's growing. People have to realize that. And um, you know, the bot in terms of bottom lines and the subsidization. Gasoline is subsidized. You know, like you know, you, people complain that they're subsidizing the, the uh, uh, wind power or solar panels. Gasoline is subsidized. I forget. I mean, it's. I'm going to say out of two dollars and fifty cents, it's probably a fifty percent subsidy. On top of that, I mean, the oil industry has been getting subsidies for a long time. So I don't see why they should be complaining about solar or wind wind energy. I'd. I'd uh direct you to the Cambridge Institute of Sustainability Leadership webpage. There are ample examples of how the circular economy can be a win-win and not a lose-lose in terms of economic and the economics and the business bottom line. Um, our national policies, to, to his point about subsidizing one thing over the other, is what really what drives carbon consumption in the United States. It, to pretend otherwise is just folly. Now, there are a lot of reasons that we do that. There are choices that we as a society have made about um, uh, the affordability of fuel and energy. And um, you know these are all choices that uh, generations before us have made. Uh, well, in my case, I'm old enough now that my generation has been making some of these choices. But those choices are left to you in the future. So come up with business models that eliminate carbon from our energy picture and create those win-wins and it'll go away because it'll make economic sense because it really can work economically if we make the choices that we need to make. Thank you. Good evening, panelists and faculty. You'll have to excuse my voice. I'm a little sick, but uh, I noticed that it's very interesting that each one of you, when asked how you got into this whole thing with the environment and environmental security, all of you mentioned another country or countries in some capacity. And other countries are extremely important. It's not just us. Obviously, many issues have all these countries intermingled and relating to each other, like migration we saw on... Colonel Liam's chart, it's a big problem relating to environmental security. And what we can do, obviously, is we can give aid to other countries. That's one way we can help. But as some of you mentioned, that can lead to a cycle of dependency. So my question is, how can we give aid to certain countries while avoiding this cycle? How can we give aid and then stay involved instead of just leaving it as that and I guess more specifically, my question is, what are some barriers that exist that prevent us from staying involved with the countries to which we give aid? Politics. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think Casey did a great job pointing out the critical nature that capacity building serves in delivering aid and avoiding the cycle of dependency. So her example was they started a program that was heavily dependent on um, U.S. Uh, knowledge and, and management, and ultimately it transitioned to largely a local effort. 
that is the goal of any aid program. Um, I can honestly say that, um, and I think this is responsive to General Sullivan's uh, last statement, there's politics involved and there's concern about how our dollars are spent by foreign nations when we invest them without adequate supervision. Um, it's a very complex process of getting uh, a country to adopt our view of corruption, which by the way, significant swaths of the world do not agree with our view of corruption. Um, so it's a process, it's not a fast process. Um, I think though, you know, you all are, many of you will travel to foreign countries as part of your studies. It wasn't nearly the opportunity when I went here as it is for you all now, and I applaud that. Programs that, uh, that the centers are running to bring people to other countries to see how the world really works. Um, that's your opportunity to be ambassadors of the United States that provide that capacity building, democracy, um, rule of law, and, and more importantly, uh, the academic and intellectual know-how that you bring to the table. Um, capacity building is the way to avoid that cycle, but it's a very, very complex thing. And you know, you have senators and congressmen who are all over you. If one little thing goes wrong and some you know, $1,000 bill gets paid inappropriately, then you have the, an IG inspection and an investigation, and, and then things get ugly. So it's, it's tough. It's, it really is tough. Mm -hmm. Let's have one last question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Morris for the rest. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my question today, uh, I think an interesting topic as far as the environment, the climate, and national security, uh, which kind of ties all things, would be power generation in the United States. Um, and we've talked a lot about uh, safeguarding and then doing things in the interest of the environment um, and national security. I just um, think that maybe resiliency might also be another thing. And I'm interested to see, whereas um, in the United States, 10% of our electrical generation comes from renewable energies. Um, it's predominantly nuclear, coal, and natural gas produ or, uh, production in the United States. I'm interested to see uh, your thoughts on balancing resiliency um, with environmental responsibility in that regards and possibly the future of power generation, keeping that in mind. When you say resiliency, how are you defining that? Um, I would say resiliency as far as um, going to the extreme of 100% renewable. Uh, currently, we don't have battery technologies that could store um, the demands of the grid and the ever-changing dynamics of that as far as uh, when we need to supply power, store power, um, and transport that. And I just would like to uh, pick you guys' brains, basically, to see how in the future that might become more of a problem for the United States, and then balancing being green and renewable where or using uh, a little bit more um, emissive sources such as coal where we can store these things on site for up to three months at different generators and things like that to offer a three month resiliency in the case of like a grid collapse or something and we could generate power in that. So I think one of the myths that we need to disabuse from the conversation is that we couldn't go 100% renewable. The reason we can't go 100% renewable is we haven't invested in technology to do it. Mm -hmm. We've made decisions to put people on the moon and we put people on the moon. We made a decision to send a rover to Mars and we sent a rover to Mars. As a society, as a, as a country, we have not made the decision to go 100% renewable, plain and simple. If we wanted to, we could. Now, there are a huge number of reasons why we haven't done that and I'm not judging anybody for getting there. Many of the reasons are sitting right in this room because you don't want to pay extra money to go uh, carbon neutral, right? I don't, I'll be the first to admit it. My budget would take a hit. But until we make a choice as a country to go in that direction and invest the research necessary to get to that point, we will suffer the consequences. We will, as General Sullivan said, pay later. So there is a cost to natural capital, and we are consuming our natural capital at a higher rate than we're replenishing it. And that bill will come due someday. I also wanted to point out that you can contact us later on to get more involved through some of the energy resilience initiatives that we will be starting pretty soon. So in the interest of time, I want to thank you for your question. Please come find me, and I'll get you more resources later on. 
So I want to Thank turn, um, I guess, all of your attention to this excellent conversation we've been engaging in, and um, want to turn it over to Dr. Morris to give us the highlights and, and a few key takeaways that we can uh, keep reflecting on as, as the evening progresses. Sure, thank you. I'd like to just uh, interject one additional point and then I'll summarize where we've been. I think, well, first I have to applaud the Marine for asking a question, but I think his response is really indicative of, I think, what happens not only here in the United States, but also broadly, is that there's a disconnect between what's something that applies to an average citizen and also to someone that's entering the military. So let me reframe this differently. So imagine if each of you were going home or back to where you're living and you were surrounded by a minefield, right, that was left from previous war. How many mines do you think are still left in Afghanistan or Sri Lanka or in Bosnia? Imagine if they're in your fields. Imagine if you're a farmer. Imagine if you're your family will live or die whether you farm the fields or not. Do you take the risk? So when we're talking about environmental security, I think it's important that we sort of outline what we're talking about um, when we're talking, when NATO outlines environmental protection and environmental security. And just think about what I just said. Seriously, think about how that would change your life and knowing that if there was a neighbor of yours that actually lost their life or a foot to a mine. This is a major problem in our world that impacts the environment and sustainability and harvests and also the quality of, of life. And the other point I think that we're trying to make here is we're a military institution that's talking about environmental security, but this is not new. The terms are new. Environmental security, climate change, these are really politically charged terms. But if I use the term scorched earth theory, scorched earth tactics. This has been used from Darius to the Persians, to the Romans, to the Napoleon, to the Ottoman Wars, to Vietnam, to Iraq, World War I, World War II. The idea of destroying resources, poisoning them, eradicating forests, so that it's impossible for an invading army or a retreating army to um, succeed in warfare. There's not, this, is, this is something that we as a military institution um, are trying to understand, and this is why NATO is currently involved, and there are dimensions of our armed services that are involved in this, but this is not a new topic. How it's, being, how it's evolved over time definitely is, but our stake, and for those of you that are gonna be junior military officers, just raise your hand. How many of you are gonna be serving in some sort of, of this is gonna be your issue, whether you think it is or not, just like cyber, that's another discussion. Um, but this is gonna be your issue. What happens when you're engaged in conflict in which we have one of our panelists that saw the effects of scorched earth in Kuwait? And there are people, Americans, that are still dealing with inhaling some of the, the, the pollutants. So I just want to encourage you that this is the beginning, not the end of a conversation. And part of it is that if, if you were disconnected through part of it, I would argue to say that you fully didn't understand how this connects to you, but it certainly does and will and to all of us. And I think uh, I'd like to just summarize our conversation two ways. One, a diagnosis, and then a prognosis. So the diagnosis piece, this is where we've been. The use of the term asymmetric. Asymmetric means that uh, someone is trying to attack a, a larger force or a larger narrative and get attention. And all of us saw this on 9-11, or at least heard about it, um, for those of you that weren't uh, born at that time. But the point of a dissident group getting a nation's attention, and it caught us off guard. And initially we went after nation states, but we figured out that that's not what we should do. And we've been, we've been working ever since to figure out how do you tackle an asymmetric problem? And we're still involved in that. The other is a transnational problem. So if some of you get married and you decide to go to Polynesia for your honeymoon and you're on the beach, and there's tons and tons of plastic that's been washed up on the beach from another country. It's transnational, and that impacts tourism. That impacts economies and people's livelihoods. And the other, thanks to the slide that was on the screen, this is something that's complex, so it involves smart people. It involves you and your intellect. And it's also interdisciplinary. You know, I, I don't know who's represented this room in terms of academics or background, but I think you can see from the panel 
it really doesn't matter your background. This is a complex problem and involves everyone to solve it. So appreciate also the discussion on uh, leadership. This is the prognosis piece. So first is awareness. Um, sometimes it may take years before someone knows that they're actually sick until the doctor says something. You can be a carrier of something. And this to some degree is how this issue is. You're really arguing whether there's symptoms or there's no symptoms. You're a carrier of something or you're not. So awareness is one, and it's really about arguing and convincing and using trends to figure out what's going on. The other is proactive, and I think, again, this is the part of having this discussion. I appreciate Paul reaching out to us and General Sullivan's work uh, here at Norwich, but also um, our entire panel and the things that they have done. This is being proactive and getting to understand the problem. And then finally, for each of you, you know, uh, I'm thinking of the undergraduate students here in, in the room. You have no idea where your life's gonna take you, or you could come back here on a panel someday in the future and talking about an issue that you have no idea. And I would argue that our two panelists on the left, when they were back here as undergrads, couldn't even write this narrative that they would be back talking about environmental security. Well, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? This will be some of you when we don't know what issues that the, the future will, will put before you and the challenges that you'll face, but this definitely be, will be one of them. And this is why your institution and your president and provost and, and those in leadership are, are saying that this is a, a discussion point. And I would also argue, finally, that the semantics of this issue are important. And if you have a problem with littering, if you have a problem with just environmental issues and you like keeping Vermont looking the way that it does, then you care about the world around you, whether you term, you're termed an environmentalist or not, but this is the reality, right, to, to be a good steward. But it's even more powerful when you become a, a steward of other people, equipment, and strategies in other countries that can take lives or save lives. So. Panelists, thank you for your contributions to this discussion. You've been a great audience. Thank you for your attention and also for those of you that ask questions. President, Provost, and Assistant Provost, thank, thank you so much for just your support along the way. Have a great day. And our panelists are around and uh, they could answer some questions if you didn't get to answer them as well. So thank you.